Hey, Keith, let's go see Terry Knight in the pack, huh? Hi, everybody. We're talking to a guest of ours today on action, Mr. Terry Knight. Hello. Terry, how are you? How are you, Keith? Fine, thank you. Where are you from, Terry? Michigan, Flint, Michigan. Flint. Right. Right. There's another group from around your area, and they're... Uh, yeah, question, question Mark, mark. and Mysterians. Right. right. They're from uh, Saginaw, aren't they? Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah, they were That's on the right. show a couple of weeks ago. What's the name of your group? Terry Knight and the Pack. The Pack. Right. Could you introduce them to us? Sure will. Pack. Our Can lead guitarist is Kirk sure Johnson. Will. Kirk. Our, lead guitarist our bass guitarist is Herman Jackson. Kirk. Our bass guitarist drummer is Donnie Brewer. Donnie. And Bob Donnie Caldwell, Brewer. our rhythm Donnie. guitarist. Bob Great. Well, we're going to sing you, have you sing a new record well, for us. Well, no, you sing it. It's really a gas. It's an old song that's been redone, and I think it's very interesting. Oh, you'll enjoy it. Terry Knight. Oh, you'll enjoy it. Terry Knight. All right, episode two in Zane, Michigan. Here we are, Rich and Johnny, at your service. Full service for everything in Zane and Michigan. Rich, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, got the first episode we got done. We uh, talked about Nolan Strong and Rick and JB from East Lansing. Um, and then now those are a little bit more, those were a tad obscure, and now we're kind of going up a notch on the rung of Michigan music and uh, talking about uh, someone who scored a little bit of success, right? Yeah, we got the almighty Terry Knight. We're going to be talking about uh, more specifically uh, Terry Knight in the pack. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, a whole lot to unpack. <laughs> right, right. So this is, uh, you know, if you're in Michigan you and you're of a certain age, you know who uh, Terry Knight is because of his affiliation with not only Terry Knight in the pack, who had some moderate success and regional hits, uh, but more so for his connection with Grand Funk Railroad, who um, for a short time was uh, huge. I mean, they filled Shea Stadium like the Beatles, sold it out apparently in 72 hours. Uh, so um, Terry Knight was not in Grand Funk, but he was the man behind the scenes, behind the curtain, and the guy who kind of facilitated getting them where they were. But then, obviously, that whole uh, that whole relationship went down in flames, uh, famously. I mean, uh, when you talk about um, terrible band-slash-management relations, that's at the top of the list of most famous uh, disaster uh, relationships, uh, period. But um, before all that, there were some cool records from Terry Knight in the Pack uh, that was right before Grand Funk. And uh, yeah, uh, John, it was your idea to do this, and it was uh, a good idea because it's one of those bands where they're always there, and you flip by the records. Yeah. And you, you might even come across one of the tracks on like a compilation, and you kind of forget to dig in to both sides of the records. And they did two LPs, and they had some singles. And uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, critics... Famously love to shit on Terry Knight in the Pack. Um, they'll say that it's not good or it's mediocre. But you talk to people from Michigan, and it's nothing but good memories. Uh, constantly online, you'll see people talking about, oh, they played at my high school. And they have fond memories. Mich Michigan people um, who are around in the 60s loved Terry Knight in the Pack. So I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of start, though, at the beginning of Terry Knight's uh, jump off into the music world, which was radio. Yeah. Um, I think like Rich was talking about, a lot of people like to crap on him. Uh, I remember back in the early psych days, you would always, people would talk about Terry Knight and, you know, people would in the same type of words, talk about the Yardbirds and it would split a lot of people about, you know, there's a pro Yardbirds, yada, yada. <clears throat> because they both did the single. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, I'd get the Terry Knight records, and I'd just be like, man, I don't know. The lettering's kind of cool on the first one, but it's it's a bit middle of the road. It's not overblown garage or anything like that. Um, so rechecking them out later with a heavy Michigan slant, I mean, they're incredible. Um, I think there's so much bad blood about what went on with the Grand Funk Railroad that it really is... You know, uh, ben, ben Blackwell said that the you know Terry Knight stuff is completely underrated, and I you know I think it really needs to be investigated. Uh, so it will be investigated by Rich and Johnny in Zane, Michigan. Okay. Uh, so anyway, Terry Knight, Aries, Strength, born April 9, nineteen forty three in Lapeer, which is over in the Flint area. Yep, and um, 
he start his first uh dj gig in the business was in 63 he was jack the bellboy on uh wjbk uh and he did that for a while and then he went back to flint uh and worked with uh wtac for a while and then he made a huge move going to windsor ckwl and he was the first dj uh to play not only question mark and the mysterians but uh the stones yeah which was, is insane to think about and this was 64 i believe right it was really early on and later on obviously he covered the rolling stones with the pack uh, he was definitely um <clears throat> a, a huge stones fan but yeah he so he started um in in the radio business and i think like you were saying earlier about critics kind of, uh, you know, trashing him. I think a lot of people always tend to look at people who didn't start out in music and, <laughs> and, they're, and they're suspect immediately. They go, yeah. okay, this guy's a radio DJ. And then now all of a sudden now he's been playing the records. So now he wants some of the limelight too. So I think him coming into that from, you know, there wasn't a, oh, hey, he really slogged it out down in the basement. He was a radio DJ and a successful radio DJ. And so people look at him through that lens. They go, okay, he's not really into this. He's, he's, ju he's not into music. He's looking for hits. Um, you know, it's like the same thing when comedians, they'll get mad at actors when actors uh, try, to Hollywood, be funny. try to get yeah. on stage and, and do a comedy special immediately. Even if it's funny, they're, they're going to go get the hell out of here. You know, <laughs> this isn't your uh, arena. Um, but you know, I think Terry Knight early on, he just loved music and that's what got him into the radio station. And he, uh, I think him being a DJ was completely to his advantage because not only is the repertoire so insane for the two records, uh, Reflections and the self-titled, uh, that were both put on 66, but they're both done in, you know, the covers are done in such a unique style, like, uh, Lady Jane is, is incredible. Wow. It, uh, it sounds more, uh you know, like a loner folk record and stuff like that. And the Yardbirds cover is done amazing. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with uh, Farner and Brewer being amazing musicians and, uh, you know, just really doing the covers well rather than just being a soundtrack for somebody to dance to or to be, you know, seen as relevant. And, um, yeah, it's it's just, you know, it's weird to think about. He said that... Uh, he, he was the best, he never wanted to be anyone, but whatever he was doing at the moment, he wanted to be the best at. And I, you know, people keep saying how Terry Knight was a character, you know, and, and I think that that's really important because the, the character he adds to these songs are just really strange. It's, it's almost art Rocky, you know, it's very English and moody bluesy. Right. And, you know, he dressed flamboyantly and he was, he was, you know, a character and he would always be like, you know, I go back to the hotel room, I'm alone. And, and if I'm going to be in front of people, I'm going to be the best I can do and hang with everybody. So it, it's almost, you know, like sociopath style or something like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, and obviously the, there was two Terry Knight in the Pack records, one in 66 and then one in 67. And uh, they both kind of. Uh, play like almost like mix CDs of like, yeah. you know, they were like Terry picking songs that he thought could p perhaps get some action on the radio. He picked songs that he liked and, um, but they didn't, oh, you know, they would kind of go through some, one of them might sound like a song from like the left bank. <laughs> and then one of them might sound like a Michigan uh, garage rock song. And then, um, yeah, so they were kind of all over the place stylistically but along the way, they had great singles. I mean, uh, even the ones where, you know, I was looking on uh, All Music Guide just totally trashes both these records, like one, one and a half stars. What was their critiques? They, they uh, say that his voice wasn't up to snuff, that his, uh, his voice sounds like a, a scratch track that a producer would lay down for the real <laughs> singer. But I mean, you know. That's insane. Then, right. And it, it's not, it's not, I mean, his voice, sure, it's. He doesn't have a husky, soulful voice, but I mean, Graham Parsons has a thin voice too. I mean, not to compare him to Graham Parsons, but uh, there, sometimes uh, you know it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the world's uh, best or most perfect voice to be a good record. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that first big single they had, um, 
was amazing. And I think it's a, you know, a Michigan, you know, masterpiece, really. Uh, the, the, I who have nothing. I mean, yeah. I mean, Originally the, written by uh, Benny King. Well, it was a Liburn, uh, Benny King. Uh, I think he, uh, he covered it, but I think that was Lieber and Stoller. Was originally wrote it? Oh, okay. Right, right. So, yeah, I, yeah but Benny d- uh, did a car. And I'm a Benny King fan, mm-hmm. um, but I, I prefer Terry Knight and the Pack's version. It's such a insane uh, version. It, it's just, you know, I think a lot of people uh, were critical of him because he was so quirky, you right. know? It was just, it's kind of like a weirdo style it's real echoey and kind of haunting sounding yeah, yeah. uh real you know, lonely it, and it's over the top it's kind of ridiculous but uh the the production on it is sometimes kind of in the red a little bit <laughs> uh but no it, it sounded uh it sounded awesome the rizza later sampled that for one of his on his 1999 record and it's basically just a rehash of uh of the, I who the, have the, nothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it sounds amazing. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a guess that there was no rights to be paid for that whatsoever. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So that that first '66 LP, um, that was the one where that was like pretty much their only hit. You know that that that, that cover got them a little bit of action. It got up to I guess like 127 on the Billboard charts, which I mean that's not bad. I mean. Not everyone gets on the Billboard charts. I mean, 67, right. the fights for the Billboard charts would have been insane. Right, right. I mean, or 66 on the first 66, one. 66, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. And But, I mean, also, on top of their covers, Terry would also write songs. And, you know, that's another critique is that uh, that a lot of cri- critics give him is that he would do, like, rewrites. You know, oh, hey, he's doing the Stones here. He's doing Bob Dylan here. Then on the very next track, okay, you know, this one sounds like Donovan. Um but you know, I, I don't care. I mean, when I listen to <laughs> if it sounds good, I like it. It it has the uh, it has the moodiness of love and uh, uh, the Rationals, but when somehow when the Rationals cover stuff, it ends up if they don't really nail it, it ends up being kind of annoying and over dramatic. Right. You right, know. Yeah. But I, I think Terry just adds his own loner weirdness to yeah. it. Like if you. Listen casually, you're not struck that these are covers at all. This is an extremely coherent record, especially for being their first one. It's insane. Right. And, uh, you know, I think the thing with Terry is he worked in radio. He was obviously a huge music fan. He knew what songs should sound like. Um, So whether it was a cover or something that he wrote, he knew what something should sound like that should be on the radio. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, and that's not a bad thing to know, especially back then. A skill. Right. Yeah. I mean, you listen to... I love all those singles, but I mean, you listen to some of those 45s, you know, from garage bands, those were never going to be on the radio. Uh, so I think Terry going in and how Terry Knight the Pack started was the very beginnings of it was he went to go see the Jazz Masters, which Don Brewer, yep. future grand funk guy, that was one of his, if not first, a very early garage band of his. Who did not have any records out, right? I doubt it. Yeah, yeah. and if they did, maybe a, a 45, but they weren't national success or anything they were the, a, a local flint band really. and this this would have been uh 64 around even right yeah um so terry goes and he's like hey i'm on the radio but i want to do my own thing i want to be on the radio uh so he <laughs> finds these kids who you know that's a good plan too he didn't try putting together a band he went and found an existing band who could just get behind him and he could tell them hey do this and those garage bands back then that's what those kids were jukeboxes i mean sure they would release a 45 of their own stuff occasionally but when they played shows those garage bands were playing top 40 hits of the time it was so, the it was the only way you could get people to dance and right. get involved like right. you couldn't you couldn't do originals yeah and yeah. yeah and they were getting paid decent money i mean i've talked to the guys who are in 60s garage bands and like some of them were like hey like eventually my parents were kind of like looking at me weird because I was bringing home so much money. <laughs> they would get paid sometimes $300 to play a show back in the 60s, and I don't know too many bands that get paid that much now. You and, know? <laughs> and they would do, uh, Terry said that they would sometimes do, when they were playing around Ohio, do three gigs a night in different places. And, and just bank. Yeah. And one of them, you know, one of them would be to 17,000 kids, you know? Right. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, uh, back then, that there wasn't much to do. Uh, if you wanted to get out of the house and get away from your parents, if you weren't going to see a movie... Go, go and see a band. I mean, in Detroit, they had the hideout. Um, 
and I'm sure they had a lot of high school dances. Uh, you know, Terry Knight and the Pack would play high schools, just like Bob Seger. I mean, Bob Seger in The Last Herd uh, would go and play. People would remember him playing on top of a cafeteria, and they pushed a bunch of tables together to make a stage, and that's where Bob Seger played when he was a kid. Um, and Terry Knight and the Pack was from that same exact uh, that same exact uh, scene. What was the um, the TV show that was so big in Detroit that would that would do? Uh... Oh right, yeah, yeah. Seeger was on there too. Um, the I black and white one. The right. spike drivers were on it and everything. Right, right. and they did the um, their single on there, correct? Yep. All right. Uh, but they were on a really big one. I'm looking for the name right now. That was in Cleveland. Oh, they were also on American Bandstand, right? Oh, yeah. They did. Uh, they were part of the Dick Clark crew. Yep. Um, so that was on that first record when they were getting some uh, some action on the charts. Yep. So, yeah, from there, Terry Knight, he was in radio. He got this little band together with, uh, with the Jazz Masters. They turned it into Terry Knight and the Pack. And along the way, right from the beginning, that's when they got Mark Farner. Mark came in after uh the jazz masters linked up with terry yep so um and then of course mark farner went on to lead grand funk railroad so terry was for all the um you know the drama that went on later and his reputation kind of getting trashed uh the band wouldn't have even existed if it wasn't for him and not i'm not downplaying what he did or whether it was right or wrong yeah. but it's just a, a fact that grand funk wouldn't have been anywhere without him kind of one of those double-edged swords you know like uh you know you got the um you got scumbag promoters or managers but you know don't have a deal without them yeah especially back then i think uh you know plus you're dealing with kids i mean i've heard don and mark both say like we weren't even old enough to sign contracts like back then you, you're supposed to be 21 they had to have like their moms sign <laughs> the contract with, with terry knight and the in uh for for terry knight in the pack stuff um and then also for Grand Funk. I mean, they were still really young. So yeah. Terry's kind of like the older dude who kind of came in and kind of mentored them, but also uh, eventually kind of was looking at the bank account before friendship, apparently. But it was it was interesting. It's a bit of a paradox because as, as big as Terry was trying to get, um, he stuck with Lucky Eleven uh, till the end. Um it was a bar in Flint that I I have have uh, unable to find any pictures of, um, but it was owned by uh, the Slaughter and Ellis guy, and uh, the guy <clears throat> Ellis Otis Ellis tried his hand at many people around Flint doing some country records, and apparently smoked a cigar and was just kind of a really weird kind of Michigan slash Southern guy. That would just sell his single straight out of the, his car, and he befriended Terry Knight because of the the radio thing, and uh, they stuck with each other. Uh, the two records were on there, and then they got bought out by Cameo and Parkway, and then Cameo and Parkway eventually morphed into Buddha. Um, so he, he stuck with them. You know, he was loyal to them for a while, uh, right? And I think. Uh... Yeah, I mean, Cameo Parkway, they also worked, again, with Seeger. So, uh, but yeah. The and look, the Rationals. And the Rationals. Yeah. Um, and they were getting hits. I, and then uh, for a while there, he was playing with Terry Knight. They had this Lucky Eleven stuff going on. And then Terry Knight and the Pack dissolved, essentially, because Terry wanted to kind of move on. So they recorded the first, the you know, batch of singles, then they recorded, and then they released a first record, 1967. That then comes the next record. So they had the second LP, and then it was after the second LP that Terry kind of went off mm -hmm. and tried to do solo stuff. And then it's not really the Harlem stuff, Shuffle stuff, and the, he did a couple singles on Capitol. Uh, it's just not very good. Uh, it's missing the the kind of almost question marky Flint Saginaw basement weirdness. I think he was trying to not be a Michigan rock band. Yeah. I think he was trying to elevate himself up to be more of a, a contemporary adult singer, mm -hmm. perhaps something like that. Um, and it just, it didn't, I think it worked. Uh, it, it wasn't good with his kind of quirky style when he ditched all the stuff and just tried to be a full on star. It, it didn't, those later singles, especially the last ones from 69 and Capital, it's just not such a lonely life. It's just not, 
right. doesn't really have the same resonance. And I think by that time, uh, Farner and Brewer were off, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so when he was off doing trying to become just Terry Knight, not Terry Knight the Pack, that's when um, Farner and Don Brewer got together, and then they formed a, the Power Trio. And that's when they said, hey, let's get in touch with Terry Knight. I mean, because Terry still had connections. He'd been trying to get, like, he went over and he tried hooking up with the Beatles and yeah, getting a, he did a job the over there. Paul is dead thing. Right, the yeah. Sir Paul or whatever uh, single he did. Um, he was kind of like chasing the coattails of the Stones. Um, so he's just trying to make it. Well, meanwhile, back in Flint, you got the Grand Funk guys. It's the earliest days of this stuff. And they, they're like, hey, they're coming off the Terry Knight, the pack stuff, fab, in the fabulous pack after Terry left. And they're like, hey, you know, you got Cream coming up. You got Jimi Hendrix coming up. You can't play this teen garage band yeah. stuff forever. So they start taking that stuff and kind of morphing it into this power trio sound that was heavier Hendrix style stuff. Um, and so they said, hey, it was Don who said, hey, let's contact Terry and see what kind of connections he can pull for us. And uh, theory or in, you know, su supposedly uh, Mark Farner was telling him like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, if I really trust Terry, I, you know, like, <laughs> but you know, who else are they going to call? I mean, you're in Flint. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, this isn't New York or LA or even Detroit. I mean, so if you're a Flint band and the, you know, a guy who's connected to Capitol records and what else are you going to do? I mean, you can't really stick with lucky 11 at that point. Cause they were already kind of, falling apart right and i yeah and i think uh, i think they knew they had something i remember reading um that they said we even in the rehearsals we know we knew this was something special so they get a hold of terry and um terry works it out and he gets them a record deal but you know what he doesn't get them a record deal with their label they sign with terry yeah. and then terry signs with the label yeah so that's if, right from the jump he's the middleman and everything has to be funneled through him. And uh, at that point, Mark Farner, who's like, you know, writing all these great songs, and he should have been getting, you know, he could have been getting 100% of this publishing. Well, right out the gate, uh, Terry Knight takes 50%. And he just tells him, hey, yeah, I'm, you know, it's just easier for me to kind of handle this for you. Um, why don't I just, you know, we'll split it. Yeah. And that's a lot of money. And, uh, and they start realizing that for, you know, they go on tour, they're working hard. Um, they're coming up and they're starting to sell records. They play the Atlanta pop festival, which was huge, uh, grand funk that is. And, um, they come back and they don't really have that much money. Yeah. And, and they go, it, what's going on? And they were, they were the start of, uh, you know, a kind of post cream post Hendrix kind of Midwest American power trio. Right. You know, it's not real bluesy. It's real. It's kind of a new sound, you know, almost was, yeah. arena rock. Right. And yeah. It, yeah. It had that. Uh, it had that rock and roll, the power trio stuff, but also like the soul music. You can tell that they were into like Southern soul. Uh, you know, they were into Motown. Um, so all that stuff is kind of filtering through. And I remember um, hearing um, that anywhere you went in Flint, you, you'd hear grand funk everywhere. <laughs> I, there's an interview with uh, Michael Moore somewhere. He's like. If you go in the store, you hear Grand Funk. You go to the park, someone's playing it on a radio. You, you get in the car, it's on the radio there too. Did not escape it, and uh, you know they just, you know, hit after hit after hit. They just kept getting more and more famous. And for a bunch of uh, blue collar dudes from Flint, it's really really amazing. And um, Terry facilitated all that. I mean, uh, he was the guy behind the scenes, um, and apparently he was also the guy behind the the, the bookkeeping as well. So they, um, they caught on to this and they sued Terry, right? This is around right. seventy one, right? So I think you know their whole, their whole lifespan was like you know six or seven years, something like that. Um, but yeah, I think by like seventy two ish or so, like that, they started getting hip to the fact that hey, we need to get out of this contract. And um, years later. Uh, Terry Knight would laugh about it. And he'd say, if they'd only waited three more months, <laughs> we would have been out of the contract. They could have just opted out of the contract. But I think, you know, you're young, you're pissed off and you go, this guy's been ripping us off yeah. long enough. And I think they probably thought, Hey, we can 
we can beat this or whatever, but they couldn't. They end up having to give Terry, uh, you know, bags of money um, to, to get out of that contract. And even to this day, um, you know, they don't hate the guy, but they don't have too fond of memories of, of working with him. Well, it seems to me that he was the one that got all the dough out of the mix. Right. right. And and Grand Funk were on Capitol then at that point? Yeah. 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 Um, so at that point, Terry leaves with a bunch of cash, uh, tr- tries to start a new label called uh, Brown Bag. Right. Uh, puts out Blood Rock. Yeah, more seventies rock. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, for better or worse, a Texas version of Grand Funk. It's I guess. very, it's middle of the road. Yeah, yeah. average at the most. Um, puts out uh, Mom, <laughs> Mom's apple pie with right. the with the infamous cover. Right, right. Yeah, very uh, classy <laughs> bunch. Yeah. And and uh, little feet, I think he yeah. put out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, uh, and around that time, right after that, uh, Grand Funk started working with Todd Rundgren. Oh wow! You know? So, um, so they kind of moved on, and you know, they had the attention of Todd and other people. I mean, yeah, they were huge. I mean, they were a huge rock band. So it wasn't hard to find someone to replace Terry. And don't get me wrong, I've said a few things like where Terry facilitated and he made them. I'm not saying someone else can have done it too and not rip them off, but uh, I think just me living in Michigan and with Flint being 30, 40 minutes away, I know all about living in the middle of nowhere. There's not industry people just driving through Flint looking to sign bands. It's it's a hard uh, thing to break through when you're from mid-Michigan, if you're from Lansing, Flint, whatever. Um, so it's unfortunate that that happened because I think they could have kept working together. And I think the band probably would have lasted longer too. Well, I think they would have, they would have, sounded more like their earlier records and probably maintained a uh, stuck with the trio right you know which yeah. was more interesting but but you never know right yeah and um you know but yeah i'm but yeah going back to the terry knight and the pack stuff i mean yeah it's it's just funny that that's a precursor to grand funk because you would never <laughs> expect that i mean if for people listening if you haven't heard of grand funk um or uh terry knight and the pack or if, you, or if you haven't listened to them we're gonna put a mixed cloud together we'll put some tunes out there yeah. you know we'll pick a, a select few but uh, yeah, it didn't sound like Grand Funk at all. You know what I mean? Um, I mean their uh, their debut, like it goes from weird, uh, just straight up rock and roll stuff to it's kind of like folky and creepy sounding. Um, you know, there's a song called "Shut In" that sounds like kind of like pretty ballerina left bank type stuff. Um, the next track, "Got Love," is more into psych rock stuff. Um, Terry wrote a song called The Changes on the Way, which is like a 60s, you know, yeah, yeah, hey, you know, come together type anthem. So, you know, it's all over the place. You know, this Love and Kind sounds kind of like Neil Diamond, Lee Hazelwood ish, you know, like he's, uh, he, people call him out for being a bad singer. He's actually, uh, you know, pretty dynamic on all the different sounds he can get and put them on a record. And it, it's still Terry Knight in the pack. Well, it's, it's, com- you know, it's completely. Uh, coherent and it flows really good it's super musical it's super itself it uh you know going back to being how insane uh flint and saginaw were you know in in the early 60s it was countryville hillbillies um still desolate and then you got question mark in one corner and you got terry knight in the other i mean these are just two very strange bands like you know if i if i would play this you know, if we would play this for you and you didn't know anything about it, you would just be like, these are just very odd bands. This right. is, this doesn't sound normal at all. <laughs> right. And um, I would have to say, uh, start with the first one. Reflections, I thought was weaker. It grew grew on me eventually. It, it's, a, it's a little more mature, kind of. Yeah, that's him more starting. I think he already knew that he was going to try moving beyond local band rock and roll stuff he wanted to try uh becoming a singer yeah you know like a for adults yeah it's a little more matured um but i mean the first one is just straight through top to bottom a, just a a unique record right uh, that yeah that second track i guess it's like a Sunday what's Bono. on your mind yeah, yeah. I, or you know uh the, no, the th- i'm sorry the third song where do you go oh yeah yeah it's, you know it's a sunny bono cover it kind of sounds like almost like weird like velvet underground if they were like folk pop you know uh, <laughs> yeah it's real just weird crazy sounding shit it's not like anything normal 
So, yeah, I mean, the guy obviously knew about hits, and he was obviously gunning for a hit. But, I mean, that song, listen to Where Do You Go by Terry Knight and the Pack, and it's just, there's no way that would have been played on the radio. He must have just thought it sounded weird yeah. and good. And it's apparently, he, he thought he was such a sick, uh, sixth Beatle or uh, Stone that they covered uh, Lady Jane without getting clearance for it, and they got shut down fast. Well, he got shut down when they did the Sir Paul yeah. uh, 45, too, because he was using lines and you know <laughs> instrumentation from all that stuff as well. <laughs> um, so it, it's just a, it's a history full of deviance and you know just being a character it's it's amazing really right right and um you know so eventually uh after the pack breaks up grand funk takes off uh then grand funk eventually dissolves too you know yeah, around um, uh the 80s right right yeah i mean and then they they'd get together for some periodic uh reunion festival stuff. stuff and then now today mark farner plays separate and then grand funk is don brewer and some other guys <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen what, you know, you know, Grand Funk with Don Brewer, they might be great. I'm not sure. Um, but the fact that you're doing Grand Funk without Mark Farner and they're all still alive. I mean, that's the whole thing about this entire situation is even all these years later, they went through that whole mess with Terry where they, you know, they felt slighted and they got robbed and they probably did. Um, I'm sure they did. I'm sure it was a bum deal. Uh, but also they're all still around too, you know, and they, yeah. it, they're, they're not working out any of this stuff. And it's, it's just a shame anytime there's music musicians and they can't just get past, Hey, let's just try to be adults here and make it work and get Mark Farner, the, the lead singer on stage with the band. I mean, it's, it's just kind of all really funny well, and I, just real petty shit. I know? think, uh, Doyle from the misfits said rock and roll is the only business where you can't get people together to make money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all, uh, you know, I'm sure it's egos and it, uh, it's really, they're passionate about it too. But I know that, uh, you know, they were doing a reunion tour, Grand Funk, in I think the early nineties or late eighties, whenever. And, um, Mark or uh, Don Brewer told Mark Farner while they were out playing a show, they were at the hotel together while they're on tour. And Mark said, Hey, we should all sign and make it to where grand funk is all like just one entity. It'll make it easier. And, uh, Mark Farner was feeling, feeling good about it. You know, they just got done playing. He felt that, you know, that they were back on track and he's like, Oh, I, I like that idea. Well, then Don Brewer tells him allegedly, this is according to Mark Farner. Well, Hey, if you want to do that, I got the paperwork up in my hotel room right now. <laughs> and so, uh, he kind of said, you know, anytime someone says, you know, runs an idea by you and they just happen to have the paperwork on them right then don't <laughs> sign it, you know, um, not a good idea. Uh, so he signed it. Well, then what happened was that, you know, after they made it where grand funk was just one entity, um, Don and the bassist were then majority owners. Uh, so that, so then Mark Farner was immediately, you know, they were kind of in their own camp. They were immediately majority stakeholders. And yeah. so Mark was kind of screwed. Yeah. And so, you know, so I don't know how, uh, how accurate that is, but that's just all this little, their little drama fest that they've had going on yeah. forever, you know, for being blue collar Flint dudes, they're definitely all about the drama and yeah. just being, divas you know well, i think we all know that michigan people can click in click on the drama mode pretty fast and they hold grudges man <laughs> yeah michigan style too they're, they're, yeah they're mad about <laughs> shit from 87 you know <laughs> that doesn't matter none of it matters you know um so uh a couple of more things i th i want to talk about uh douglas uh fisky who did the uh art production uh, both these records look amazing. They're very yeah. iconic right. uh, records. And he also did the Question Mark records. Uh, he did the Deep Psychedelic Moods record, which is amazing. Uh, the New Colony 6. Uh, did some other stuff. Interesting guy. They uh, look legit. Yeah, yeah, they look legit. Uh, Upbeat was the TV show that they were on Cleveland a lot. There's hardly any footage of the pack uh, plan at all. There's a couple of lip sync. There's a really good black and white one of him doing, uh, I who have nothing, Yep, which is lip sync, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, there's not a single Terry Knight interview to be found anywhere live. He did something on behind the music, uh, but you can't find it. Uh, that's on YouTube. 
Oh, it is? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I couldn't see it. Right. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll send you a link. Um, Apparently, it's real dark. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and that's where some of the stuff that I'm mining from. That's mm-hmm. where I heard Mark talking about the ho- going up to the hotel room and uh. all these shady deals. They should just do a shady <laughs> deals reunion tour, <laughs> uh, do a roundtable discussion of how they all uh, screwed each other over as much as they could. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, the, the artwork looks great. Yeah. It, it matches the music. I mean, you got Terry Knight on the front. He kind of, yeah, I mean, he dressed cool. He's got the, the polka dot shirt. It's kind of a, almost a Davy Jones look, but also I think he was going more for like English rocker. Yeah. He doesn't look like he's from Flint, Michigan. That's for sure. Well, the, the Michigan thing that gives it away, like we talked about before is there's not a single smile to be found on any of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Michigan, it's, ice it's, grill for 420 all around. It, it's gloomy <laughs> for sure. And, you know, and obviously, you know, in Flint back then it was, this is before, um, the auto industry, uh, was completely ransacked. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, back then, you know, a lot of people have really good memories of Terry Knight in the Pack and Grand Funk because that was a time when Flint was thriving. Yeah. You know, they, they had jobs, they had good music, they had Grand Funk, which was one of the biggest rock bands in the world. So, yeah, I mean, even today, I mean, I was like just kind of like drifting through a Detroit rock and roll from the whatever 70s Facebook page and, um, you search terry knight in the pack in there it's all good memories no but you know like so i think it's a lot of people from out of michigan who kind of like not stoked they yeah and they zero in on okay he's just kind of like a hack or or um or a crook um but if you're around in michigan especially when they're actually playing good vibes and that's uh pretty much where the good vibes end (laughs) right um to to bring it up to date uh he Terry Knight retired from the music industry, apparently rich from Grand Funk Money in 73. Uh, Then, like we talked about before, I tried the Brown Bag Records thing. That didn't play out. Uh, I think that lasted until like 75 or something like that. They they even tried to mail uh, apple pies with a a hot mom's apple pie record, which is, (laughs) yeah, that record's just doomed from the beginning. Right. Um, And then he got really into cocaine. Uh, partied with Twiggy and Paul Newman, got really into race cars, and uh, disappeared until his death in 2004 in Texas. Uh, Rich, you want to give the details of that gory exchange? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a sad story. I mean, it's definitely, uh, he didn't budget wisely. Uh, he got a, a, a big, huge payout from Grand Funk, but like you said, he was probably blowing it on race cars. I don't know what he was doing, but you know, he was living, um, very modestly. Um, and he was living, I believe with his daughter at the time. Uh, and, um, this was in November 1st, 2004. Um, there was methamphetamines involved and his daughter's boyfriend, uh, stabbed him to death multiple times. So, um, and he, he died pretty much protecting his daughter. Right. Right. the, The fight. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, and it was brutal. I mean, obviously no one ever gets, uh, stabbed in a nice and gentle way, but it was not a good scene. And anytime you mix methamphetamines with knives, it's not going to end well. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's it, terrible. It, it, it's a bummer. Um, and you know, his daughter was there obviously. And I think her name's Delilah. Or? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I guess, you know, he was uh, cremated, and he's in Lapeer, Michigan. Yeah, his gravestone's there. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a sad ending, and it just shows that, you know, when you have hits in the 60s, people will think you have money forever, and it's just like actors. Uh, you know, I was just watching— um, Characters, yeah. Right. I mean, I was just watching something. I went down a YouTube rabbit hole and wound upon— they were talking about the the son, the kid on the Adams Family— Back in the '60s on the TV show, I forgot what his name. The was. little weird looking dude. Yeah. yeah. Um. But uh. Yeah. I mean, he was pretty much broke when he died, and you know, he'd say, "Hey, like back in the '60s, I would get paid whatever to show up." But you know, I wasn't getting royalties, you know, yeah. and all this stuff. So, yeah, when you're in entertainment, there's no pension plan. You're you have to figure it out. So he didn't figure it out well. Terry Knight did not. Yeah. So um, he he was pretty much. I don't. I don't know if he was broke, but he was definitely not living like a rock star at the end. And like like we talked about in uh, in Zane, Michigan, number one, 
uh, Fortune Records doesn't really have a reissue plan at all. Right. Um, you know, they got the Fortune's got the book coming out, uh, but apparently, from what I could tell, there's no CD reissues. There's no reissues of Terry Knight and the Pack stuff around at all. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's Abco owns uh, the the Cameo Parkway stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, just like Abco owns the Cameo Parkway stuff that Seeger and the Rationals and stuff put out. Um, but yeah, so uh, a, a man named Donald A. Fair is the one who got convicted of the murder of Terry Knight, and his daughter's name uh, was Danielle. Okay. So yeah. Um, Terry Knight, as far as his Michigan creds go, recently he got inducted into the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Online Hall of Fame. So um, there's still some love for him here. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day someone can do something proper as far as a reissue on Terry Knight and also the fortune stuff, obviously. I, I want to see that happen. That's, uh, well, I mean, a, a really nice uh, double LP of both records yeah. would be really cool. They would work well yeah, together. They would um, really yeah. be nice with yeah. a... Uh, you know, or either one of the LPs with a comp, you know, comp, comp of the singles would really go well. I, I mean, right. I think Michigan people would be really in the world would be really stoked to recheck these out and see how actually weird yeah. they are. And, and they're just moody. They're downer records. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, yeah. And Terry Knight in a nutshell is this was a dude who was on a mission to be involved in music. And he, he liked the idea of crafting music that would sound good on the radio and um, you know whether critics like it or not. I mean, I think uh, they did some legendary mu- Michigan stuff. Uh, they're definitely a part of that whole Seeger Rationals clan, Bossman and right. Dick uh, Wagner and stuff, and, and Boy yeah. Dukes. Uh, you know, all that yeah. all that era was happening around then. It was a really exciting time. Well, to you be in stack Michigan. you stack them up against the Amboy Dukes, and it's it's night and day, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, I think the yeah, people should definitely reevaluate the records, and I'm I was happy to dig back into them because yeah, I mean, is every track on these amazing? No, you know, but I'm, as a whole, they're incredible, right? Yeah, right? Um, and I think they're definitely a lot better than what some people give them credit for. I think eventually, I've noticed it with criticism with both movies and music. People will hear stuff and they just start regurgitating that into their into their criticism. So like yeah. they hear, oh well, Terry Knight was just a radio DJ producer who was trying to show off and trying to. He was a ripoff, yeah. right? And I think if you take away that backstory and if they didn't know that, I don't think they'd be as harsh. And I, I think it's funny if you go to that All Music Guide review. <laughs> some guy actually left a comment on there, like, "Really? What's all this hate about?" He's yeah. like, "He's like, you think his voice is that bad?" <laughs> And that guy's uh, response is pretty much dead on. It's like it's not that bad. It's it's good. And uh, but I think, yeah, it's just there's two camps: people who appreciate it for what it is, and then other people who are digging too much into the backstory and they're digging up the the back yeah. history that has nothing to do with the music itself. I mean, I, I got these recently. Uh, I got them both for nothing, like at the dollar each, from someone I was buying Michigan Christian Records from. And I didn't think about it at all. And I put on uh, the first one and I was like, this is amazing. And then as you know, I talked to you about it and Blackwell and everybody else, they're just like, hey, super underrated. And then the darkness reared itself, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's Flint. I mean, uh, there isn't too much going on in Flint that got big. So um, the fact that he was a mover and a shaker, I mean, he was on taking jets to other countries trying to make shit happen. Yeah, he was six member of the Stones. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. pretty intense. And right. he he uh, he said his first love was uh, R and B, and the second one was classical. Yeah, you know, so that's an interesting mix in itself. You right, know? and you can hear that on you know that one track shut in. I mean, it's definitely kind of classical. And, yeah, you know, art rock. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, Definitely give give them another shot. Yeah, and and if you want more inter- information on them, the uh, Perfect Sound Forever has two really good interviews with them, or one over you, one overview, one interview, uh, really informative. Uh, but there's not really a lot out there about them. No. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, it's uh, you know, definitely a sad ending to it as well. I mean, there's a whole true crime thing there that we won't kind of drudge up. Um. But uh, yeah, I wish he was still here because I would love to talk to him. Yeah, you know, I mean, and there's always two sides to the story too. I mean, uh, you know, the defense of well, I was young and stupid. 
only go so far. I mean, and plus from my background where I've interviewed lots of musicians over the years, it's, uh, you know, especially with people from back in the day, it's the same old story. The management ripped me off. Yeah. The label ripped me off. I, sh I, you know, I was selling all these records and I should have made this much money and that much money. And when it comes down to it, was it right that you got ripped off? Probably not, but you signed a deal, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it, it's rough and it, it's, yeah. it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but, uh, that's how that works. And should have, they sat down and worked it out and not sued each other for millions of dollars. Probably. Yeah. But apparently these guys, you know, they went Michigan style and decided to hold that grudge <laughs> until people, <laughs> apparently uh, forever, forever. Yeah. Um, and Knight's uh, famous quote was, the critics don't count, the fans do. You know, right. and that was cool. So, right. yeah. Respect. Yeah, most definitely. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, have anything else to say on Terry Knight? Uh, I think that I think uh, the, the Terry Knight story is over. Um, I think we got some... Uh, some moves we're making for the upcoming Insane Ones. Uh, Rich got in contact with uh, Rick and JB, or... Yeah. From episode one. Yeah. yeah. So we're trying to get him down for an interview, which is going to be amazing. Uh, we just hollered at some Kalamazoo boys yep. about some Kalamazoo history. Yep. Um, uh, we're trying to do one on Pete. Uh, Pete Wittig. Yeah. From a, another Lansing guy uh, who was in a band um, with uh, Alto Reed, who went on to play C uh, Seeger's uh, saxophone. For many, many years, he still is Seeger saxophone That's player. That's amazing. He's the guy who wrote the uh, beginning to uh, uh, turn the page, that saxophone intro. That's Alto <sighs> Reed, man. Iconic. Yeah, and he was uh, here bumming around East Lansing. It's kind of funny. Um very flam, you know, flashy, flamboyant dude on stage. He dresses wild, but uh, and that's the one who uh, Sinclair wrote the poem about. Um, no, that was oh. a that was a dude who uh, a different guy. We can talk about him too. That was a tip that we got from Steve oh, Miller. Yeah, yeah. So he's a yeah, he was a, a different cat. But uh, Pete was in a band called Ormandy, and we definitely want to get in touch with Pete. I used to have his phone number, and I can't find it, <laughs> uh, and it's unlisted. So, but I'm going to track him down. He's a a real good guy. And he was in Brown Bag, right? Or no, he was in plain... just just Ormandy. I, okay. I'm not sure if he was ever in Plain Brown Rapper. I'll have to look. But I'm sure he was in other bands, and he went on to play uh, folk solo stuff. He has a private press solo record Which out there. It's rare as... Yeah, it's very yeah. rare. And he played, I mean, he might still be playing somewhere. I mean, I know as of even a few years ago, he would show up and do... There's people playing solo at the, you know, at the farmer's market, and Pete would be there playing <laughs> still a few years ago. So this is stuff where, I mean, and Pete was playing back in the 60s. So he... He never gave up. So what what uh what were some takeaway points for talking with uh the Rick and JB guy? Um so far I just I kept it short with him with the initial chat about him. We mostly talked about other stuff. Uh, uh -huh. you know, we started just talking about Michigan, but um they he worked at um WKAR um which is the station there yeah. at MSU. So um you know, that's where they recorded that album Wake Up and Smell the Coffee at a studio on MSU's campus near the radio station in a Kwanzaa hut. Wow. Um, and yeah, they would play all the, the little venues that you were mentioning. <laughs> they played uh, you, Coral Gables too, right? Yeah, yeah. Coral Gables. They played down in the basement of Coral Gables, which is still a restaurant in, um, right between like East Lansing and Okemos. Yeah. Um, Bob Seeger played there in the basement. A lot of bands played which there. Which was right across the street from the stables. The right? stables, yeah. which is now demolished. But yeah, they'd bring in, you know, blues and jazz heavyweights. Yeah. Where San, where uh, Sansu is now, right? Right, yeah. right. Or yeah. no, AI. AI. AI back, sushi. <laughs> it, it was back a little bit further, I think. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, he was super nice. He's He still works in radio. Um, this Didn't is, think the record was genius. Yeah, I mean, he he was kind of. I mean, he didn't really say he didn't like gloat about it, but he also didn't he didn't uh, shit on it either. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think he's just like, oh yeah, we did that. So I'm, I'll be interested to kind of dig in and see how much personal attachment he still has to that. Yeah, apparently I heard somebody commented something that the record was about a divorce or something like that. Right. Yeah. that that'd be good to know a college age divorce. That's <laughs> that's uh that's moving along through <laughs> yeah, life yeah. briskly. Um but uh yeah so and then beyond that uh, I haven't told you this yet but I've been kind of uh for another bigger name I've been thinking about trying to do Del Shannon. Oh wow. Um he was a Michigan guy. He lived in Cooper's Hill which is a little area outside of Grand Rapids. And uh, so that's where he came up. And um, so he obviously had the early hits run away, but then he did a couple later 60s records. 
Home and Away and the further uh, the further adventures of Charles Westover, which is his real name. And they're both trippy as fuck. Oh, and they're, wow. they're really good. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, and they're the two records where, um, you know, just recently a, a, a label called Trouble in Mind uh, reissued one of them. But for years, um, I mean, I posted some of that stuff up on my YouTube channel 10 yeah, yeah. years ago. Uh, in I'm not saying I, I broke these records, obviously, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's those records where I think people should care about them more. Yeah. Um, and so, and it was these, uh, you know, Del Shane, you got this guy from the early 60s trying to still make it like, you know, nine years is an eternity when you're a pop star. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. um, so he was kind of like dipping his toe into like more progressive rock, but like he he couldn't fully pull away from that early Del Shan stuff. So it's like a mix, like, It'll be this real poppy stuff, and then it'll just, you know, you know, melt down into this like uh, cosmic, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so they're really good. I'll have to get you those records yeah. so you can listen to them. And obviously, he ended, you know, tragically as well. He he committed suicide, and there's a whole story behind that. And his wife was very public about that sad situation um, and what caused it, what she thinks caused it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot to talk about with Dell. Uh, plus that keyboard on Runaway. I mean, that it's real weird. And that guy, there's some amazing interviews with the guy who played keyboard on that, on this weird little, uh, I don't even know what the hell it is. Uh, but yeah, so he has an interesting uh, discography that I think is definitely worth re-looking at. I mean, nobody ever talks about Del Shannon anymore. No. It's yeah. from that era where, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you could still hear that shit on oldies radio. Yeah, yeah. But now oldies radio is like you two. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people don't, even in Michigan, I mean, when I was a kid going back to Terry Night the Pack, I used to hear, uh, you know, their their big single, um, or one of them was uh, uh, Mystery or Better Man Than I. Yeah, yeah. And I would hear Terry Night in the Pack's version on the radio when I was a kid on, I think it was 96.1 maybe. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. played oldies. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I would hear Terry Night in the Pack on the radio. Because I'm in Michigan, yeah, you know, yeah. but I'd also hear Del Shannon and they would still play fifties and sixties music a bit. And that's kind of gone. So, yeah. um, I think he needs a, a, a little bump, um, and people talking about him more. Well, we got, uh, we're hoping to nail some time down with Steve Miller. Yeah. The be a big one. Yeah. yeah. And we got a lead on the bass player from the frost, which will really be intense if we can right. pull that sucker off. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah Gordy. Yeah. So yeah, I met Gordy Garris from the Frost, and he was also in the Bo Jens, which oh, was, yep. Uh, yep. the Grand Ledge Garage Band. But also he played in the Frost with uh, Dick Wagner, which uh, obviously that was a, a much bigger deal. So yeah, there yeah, there's a lot going on uh, with with Gordy, and uh, yeah, I talked with Steve Miller recently, and he's definitely game to talk to us sometime in March. So yeah, that's gonna we'll, be that's gonna be a big talk right there. Yeah, we'll yeah. dig into the Hobies and <laughs> yeah. all this other East Lansing, uh, strange fruit and everything, man. Bad yeah. brains crashing at his house. And, oh uh, man, yeah. Where to start with that sucker? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and he toured. I mean, I think he toured all the way out to the California. Oh so. yeah, once once and back. Right. Yeah, there's actually footage without sound of the California gig, and it looks amazing. Yeah. somebody found it recently right yeah. yeah steve had never even seen that yeah so um th that'll be a good um i mean i've been good friends with steve for years and i never uh you know pick his brain or bug him about it so <laughs> I, it'll be a good excuse to finally bug him about it well yeah cool uh that's uh in zane michigan part two terry knight wrapped up uh and peep the website uh, in zane uh rich and i be putting up a michigan record a day every other day or something like that and a bunch of info and pictures and stuff in a mix cloud with the Terry Knight yep. stuff. Yep. Uh, so we'll pull out a few tracks that, uh, hand selected of the ones to where you should start. So, uh, in Zane, Michigan, uh, dot com. If somebody says that they got a contract with them, don't sign it. Right. Right. <laughs> Especially if it's in their back pocket. <laughs> yep. All right. Stay in Zane. This is Johnny. Later. Later.